Assalamu alaikum. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Reem Al Jada, and I'm a junior student majoring in art history at Virginia Commonwealth University. It is my great honor and pleasure to introduce the next speaker, Dr. Angelica Neubiers, who is Professor Emeritus of Quranic Studies in the Frey University in Berlin. Professor Neubiers received her PhD in 1972 with a thesis on Abdul Latif al Baghdadi's book Lambda on Aristotelian metaphysics published in 1976. She brings her expert knowledge of Persian language and literature, Oriental studies, and classical philosophy. Her research focuses on the Quran, its interpretations, and modern Arabic literature in the Eastern Mediterranean, especially Palestinian poetry and prose. I am personally very much looking forward to hearing her scholarly discussions on the Quran. Her presentation is entitled Scripture, Revelation, and Writing, the Quran's Epistemic Recast of Arabian Late Antiquity. Please join me in welcoming Professor Angelica Neuvier. And I'm particularly happy to be able to speak after my dear colleague uh, Robert Hoyland, who um, talked about the birth of Arabic writing, uh, among other things, from, on stone. I will turn to the birth of Arabic writing uh, in heaven. Hmm. Now, <clears throat> what is missing in Quranic studies today? For decades, historical and literary approaches have been pursued to explain and reconstruct the Quran's genesis side by side, only to develop conflicting visions. Historians tend to isolate the text from its social context, the prophetic proclamation in Mecca and Medina, preferring to relate the text to the religious traditions of its Jewish Christian milieu. Literary scholars, contrarily, accept the Arabian setting, reading the Quran, however, as a premeditated composition, an authorial work of the Prophet Muhammad. Both seem to neglect what is perhaps the essential characteristic of the Quran, namely its claim to be inspired speech, wahi, wahyun, to present knowledge predicated not on Aristotle's propositional system, but revelational or covenantal knowledge, predicated on a hermeneutics determined by transcendent references. Respecting this distinction, my following talk we look for the Quran's epistemic dynamics, its innovative potential that eventually triggered the fundamental renewal of, late antique, of the late antique world that we are concerned with at this, uh, on this conference, the emergence of a new Near Eastern culture of the book. My claim is that this cultural transformation was achieved through the Quranic negotiation and reinterpretation not only of the neighboring monotheist traditions, but no less of the ancient Arabic lexicon of concepts. I propose to read the Quran as nothing less than the document of a cultural turn, an epistemic revolution deeply anchored in the heritage of Arabia. The essential innovation introduced with the production and subsequent codification of the extensive and highly sophisticated text of the Quran can, without exaggeration, be termed the discovery of writing. But after what we heard from Robert, this needs to be put in quotation marks. I do not intend here the evolution of a new script, or so the development of the Hijazi form of writing displayed unexpectedly for me until now, unexpectedly, and probably for the first time on a large scale in the oldest codices of the Quran, is an innovation that still evades further study. Uh, hmm? Doesn't it? The change I have in mind is still weightier with the Quran in my view, Arab society underwent a shift from what the anthropologist Jan Asman has termed the ritual coherence 
of a society to a new form of social and individual orientation, which results in its textual coherence. To quote Asman, it is obvious that in the history of the connective structure of societies, the invention of writing marks a decisive break. It is writing that divides history into two phases, a phase of ritually supported repetition and a phase of text-supported interpretation. The decisive turn from ritual to textual coherence is, however, not yet achieved by writing as such, but only by the standstill of the stream of oral tradition, end of quote. In the Quranic case, it is of course not the invention of the technique of writing which long antedates the emergence of the Quranic text, which matters, but rather the acknowledgement that the stream of scriptural tradition has come to a standstill with the Quran which figures as a new manifestation of scripture. This perception is inseparable from the divine investiture of writing. Asman states, again quote, even in society that societies that possessed an elaborate oral culture, writing in the public recognition played a much more important role. God himself writes. He is the author and the scribe of the tablets handed out on Sinai, and he keeps the book on the deeds of the humans. What needed to be written down was first of all one issue, the law, the instruction, the Torah, which was to be preserved and heeded regardless of adversities. A strong nexus between writing and bindingness Heed, reading and heeding was at work here, also not initially, initially supported by a worldly apparatus of power. Writing was depoliticized to become the most important dispositive of divine power, end of quote. Similarly, the Quran derives the authority exerted by writing ultimately from its divine pedigree. Now, writing uh, before the not writing before the discovery of writing. Once we turned to the Arabic written testimonies transmitted from pre-Islamic time, we face a conundrum. Also, recent archaeological expeditions have brought to light innumerable rock inscriptions dispersed over wide regions of the Arabian Peninsula. There are hardly any written units attested that would deserve, I don't know if you share this view, Robert, that would deserve the qualification of a significant text. Most of the rock inscriptions, most of the rock inscriptions, some of which are at least partly in North Arabian language, employ the Nabataean script. They are extremely short and mostly dedicated to private, mostly, ephemeral issues. So writing is existent materially, even to be found in the desert. Uh, writing also should have been familiar not only to some of the ancient Arab poets, uh, but following Khalil Asamina, uh, Nasruddin al-Assad, and Claude Gilliot, uh, also to many of the urban contemporaries of the Prophet. And yet the practice of writing was obviously not employed to create an archive of collective memory. On the contrary, as we shall see, the phenomenon of writing exhibited most prominently on the rocks in the nomadic, in the nomadic landscape, and consequently, ah, oh no, no, it's, sorry, and consequently observed and reflected upon by the Bedouins and their literary spokesmen, the pre-Islamic poets, rather aroused ambivalent feelings, and even seems to have exerted a destabilizing, indeed sometimes deterrent effect. Orally transmitted texts, however, not only existed in considerable quantity, but also in the shape of both poetry and heroic tales, Ayam al-Arab, attest a keen stylistic and rhetoric interest and competence on both the side of their composers and their recipients. Poetry, by virtue of its cache of panegyrics on particular tribes and lampoons on others, has been labeled the Diwan al-Arab, 
the archive of the Arabs. The realm of ideas put forward in these texts is, however, limited to their uh, particular milieu, which can be captured through an equally limited scope of literary genres. The narrative to report heroic tales, the uh, panegyric employed in poetical sections extolling, extolling the poet's tribe, Fakhr, and the descriptive in the middle part of the Qasida, which depicts the poet's camel or his itinerary through the desert was. Important to note is the almost total absence of discursive speech. There are no theological, legal, or cultic debates in pre-Islamic poetry. Indeed, little theoretical thinking can be traced if we do not concede one important exception. The Dhikr al atlal section, the lament on the deserted encampments. There is arguably a serious philosophical interest lurking in the Nasib, the introductory part of the Qasida, which in James Montgomery's words, quote, expresses a pessimism and sadness which sow the seeds of doubt concerning the validity and general relevance of living one's life according to the dictates of Bedouin ethic, end of quote. We will return to this issue in the discussion of the ambivalent perception of writing. It is a striking fact then that the Quran appears seemingly, seemingly out of the void as a full-fledged discursive text, extensive in range and replete with theological and philosophical queries. This observation has been vexing Western scholars for generations. The Quran's surprising richness of ideas and its consummate form have even roused doubts about the genuineness of the Islamic narrative of the Quran's origin as such. How can an intellectually sophisticated literary text emerge from a remote space like the Arab Peninsula. The conventional image of the empty Hijaz has only been corrected more, uh, in more recent scholarship, thanks to Peter Brown, Glenn Bowersock, Christian Robin, Garth Foden, James Montgomery, and Robert Hoyland, of course, and others, who have provided historical, epigraphic, and iconic evidence for the fact that a transfer of late antique knowledge from both the northern and the southern neighboring regions to Arabia had been going on during the centuries preceding the appearance of the Quran. So our knowledge of these processes uh, is still incomplete. Yet the fact remains that the Quran comes as a sudden disclosure in Arabic language of until then unspoken of or at least unattested discursive ideas. Now, um, to come back to the ambivalent perception of writing in the eyes of those nomadic individuals who are represented by the ancient Arab poets. There is a corpus, a whole corpus of Jahili, uh, of Jahili verses that mention a writing called by different names, such as Khad Zabur, the writing of a writ, Ma Bil Qalam, the writing of the reed pen, Khad Dawet, writing from ink, from an ink horn, Rasm, writing, and uh, other designations. One name for writing, however, stands out, Wahi, Wahyun. Wahi is not no technical term for writing, of course, um, but rather denotes a non-verbal communication such, uh, through signs such as may take place between animals, for instance, or if between humans involving a foreign, ununderstandable language. In pre-Islamic poetry, however, Wahi is usually applied to the writings found by the observer, that is the uh, persona of the poet, engraved on a rock or applied to it as a graffiti. We saw graffiti, we saw uh, examples just now. It is a writing which he does not or cannot decipher. 
a sign system devoid of meaning, an appropriate metaphor for the poet's existen existential aphoria. Take, for instance, the verse of Zohair. Liman talalun kal wahi aafin manazilu. Afarasu minhu farusaysu faakilu. Who now inhabits a remnant like writing? Its dwellings effaced, effaced there are Aras, Arusais, and Akil. And again, so here, Liman, Limani Diaru, Rashidu Habil Fatfadi, Kalwahi, Fi Hajar il Masili il Muhlidi, who now inhabits the abodes which I chanced upon on the hard ground, like the inscription on a perdurable rock in the torrent bed. There is no space here to quote the numerous further references to Wahi in ancient Arabic poetry. Mentions of Wahi, like the ones quoted, are always found in the initial section of the Qasida, the Nasib, which often starts with the Atlal motif, the poet's nostalgic lament on the site of the ruined encampment where he remembers a happy past in the company of his friends and his mistress. The Nasib is uniquely open to poetical introspection. It invites reflections on the transitoriness of emotional fulfillment and moreover of the on the futility of human life as such. Susan Setkevich has explored the poet's stance vis-a-vis -vis the Atlal. In her view, the image of writing in the desert scenario was meant to induce the poet's awareness of aporia. Since the rocks with their writings on them do not speak for themselves, in, but bear messages that must be deciphered, the poet in Labitz Mu'alaka, for instance, stops to query the rocks and the ruins, Sa'al Tuha, as well as as uh, well aware that they, the mute immortal, Summun Khawalidu, will not speak. Yet Susan Sitkevich argues they do offer a response to the poet's aporia, symbolizing, uh, quote, the permanence of nature and the impermanence of culture, and thus ultimately nature's immortality and man's mortality, end of course. The rock inscriptions, the wahi, associated with muteness, are invoked to illustrate the delusiveness of culture. Their lines and shapes in the poet's eyes represent not a valid sign system, uh, but an empty signifier, reflecting the devastated states, uh, state of the poet's past, of his encampment, which is erased to the ground and reduced to the linear traces of its foundations. Writing, then, represented by Wahi in pre-Islamic poetry, is a kind of shorthand sign for the negation of the validity and relevance of Muruwa, the Bedouin world view, evoking the consciousness of aporia and the perception of loss. It plays an ambivalent role in the po poetic perception. It is also more striking uh, then to find that this wahi of loss, a wahi that remains mute, has been inverted in the Quranic lexicon uh, completely. Wahi in the Quran denotes inspiration. It even successively acquires the meaning of revelation as such. It is noteworthy that not only wahi but also ayah, sign, trace, is part of the imagery of the Atlal sections in ancient Arabic poetry. In the Quran it is, like Wahi itself, recontextualized. Quranic Wahi, to quote Ghassan Mosri, ends up in the form of ayat, signs, indications, indices, epistemic tools that disclose to the listener the hidden significance of his surrounding, surroundings, end of quote. The Quran, however, not only undemonizes uh, pre-Islamic wahi, it at the same time re-establishes writing as highly meaningful. How did this reversal come about? 
Now, the idea of writing as an authoritative source of knowledge, although ubiquitous in the later parts of the Quran, was not a given when the proclamation of the Quran set in. There is no reference to writing in the earliest surahs. We can trace its entrance into the Quranic discourse more or less precisely thanks to a recent attempt to rearrange the early Meccan surahs chronologically. Let us follow the Quranic sequence uh, that established, they established and check what references to writing and oral performance are first and in what context they are embedded. Where writing appears first is in a cluster of quite early surahs, though not the earliest, that establish a relation between the prophet's proclamation and a celestial writing on the one hand, and earlier prophecies on the other. It is in Surah Al-A'la, uh, 87, that the Quranic message is credited with a direct relation to a Sohof Al-Ula, the most ancient scrolls, and thus to the written monotheist tradition uh, for the first time. The surah is concluded by the verses, Inna hadha lafi sohof al-ula sohofi Ibrahima wa Musa. Surely this is in the most ancient scrolls, the scrolls of Abraham and Moses. The Quranic message thus claims to be substantially identical with earlier written, written messages conveyed to or by Abraham and Moses. It is worth noted, noting that the same, in the same, that the same surah, Al-A'la, also contains the first reference to the act of communicating the message described as a performance not of recitation, I would not translate this as recitation, but of reading, explicitly designated as qara'a, to read. The last verse says, la sanuqri'uka fa la tansa, the last verse, verse six. Uh, oh, it, this is the verse. This reading, however, raises the question as to the particular template that the reader could draw on. What is the writing that the messenger reads his message from? This gap in information is filled by the immediately ensuing Surat al-Alaq, which projects a non-earthly writing as the source of the Prophet's reading. The surah starts, Iqra bismi rabbika ladhi khalaq, khalaq al-insana min alaq, Iqra wa rabbuka al-akram aladhi alama bil khalam, alama al-insana ma'alam ya'alam. Read in the name of thy Lord who created, created man from a blood clot. Read since thy Lord is the most generous who taught by the pen, taught men that he knew not. It's Abra's translation. The idea of a heavenly writing, so not explicit, is distinctive. If God taught by the pen, Al-Qalam, we may justly assume that the source of the prophet's reading should be a text provided by those celestial scribes who are evoked in the introductory verses of Surat Al-Qalam. Surat uh, 68, Noon wal qalami wa ma yasturun. Noon by the pen and what they write, the motto of our conference. In other words, the prophet is taught to read onto his community from a materially absent, transcendent writing. This scenario of his reading reminds us of the story of the Prophet's initiation reported by Ibn Ishaq, which equally features a technical, the technical act of reading. It's also, the Sira story is built on these Quranic verses of Surat al alaq It differs from the Quranic scenario in that it introduces a material writing, a kind of lafita, a kind of poster, presented by an angel as the master copy to be read from by the prophet. The Quranic text as such in Surat al-Alaq as against that alludes to a transcendent divine writing. 
the slightly later Surat al Infitar uh, turns to another, a different product of supernatural writing. It evokes the celestial scribes in their activity of producing the registers of men's deeds. They are to provide the evidence for the knowledge to be disclosed to the humans resurrected on Judgment Day. وَإِنَّ عَلَيْكُمْ لَحَافِذِينَ كِرَامًا كَاتِبِينَ يَعْلَمُونَ مَا تَفْعَلُونَ Yet there are over you watchers, noble writers who know whatever you do. Similar references could be adduced from Surat al-Taqwir and Surat al-Inshiqaq. The most significant writing, however, on which the reading of the Prophet draws is the comprehensive corpus of knowledge kept on the preserved tablet, Allah al mahfuz a Quranic concept that comes very close to the idea of the heavenly tablets cherished in the Book of Jubilees, which contain instructions to be communicated by men through prophets. Surah al burhuj concludes, بَلْ إِنَّهُ قُرْآنٌ majid fi لَوْحٍ mahfuz but it is a glorious Qur'an, I would translate as a glorious reading from a text preserved in a guarded tablet. It is in this context that the name Al-Qur'an, which by now at this stage of the development, conveys the meaning of a reading by the Prophet Muhammad from a celestial text, is first mentioned it will soon become the standard self-designation of the message. In, yeah, I have to skip here some similar references in other surahs. The heavenly writing, whose close relationship to creation, indeed its synchronicity with or even priority over creation, which was already alluded to in Surat al-Alaq, Iqra bismi Arabic al-Azi khalaq, returns as the subject of one of the latest early Meccan surahs, Lemi Surat al-Arrahman. Arrahman, alaq al-Qur'an, alam al-Qur'an, khalaq al-insan ala mahul bayan. The merciful, he taught the Qur'an, the reading. He created men, he taught him clear speech. This is a text that puts the creation of man second in rank or even in time to that of the text and thus comes close to the perception of pre-existent Torah as mentioned in Proverbs where it says the Lord Torah speaks about uh, itself. The Lord created me as the beginning of his way, the first of his works of old. This understanding does not yet clearly transpire in Surah Al-Alaq. It becomes, however, predominant after Surah Ar-Rahman. It is ultimately because of this pedigree, of this uh, genealogy, of the Prophet's reading, its relation to the heavenly writing, the pre-existent word of God, in late antique terms, it would be the Logos, that writing in early Meccan Surahs rises to the rank of the most authoritative vehicle of power. It is made present in a double manifestation, primarily in the shape of the lofty book of divine decrees, the preserved tablet, the transcendent scripture that is successively communicated to prophets and which encompasses the divine will according to which man is supposed to lead his life. Somewhat more lowly, there is the register of the human deeds which documents man's heeding or not heeding to these precepts. Thus, two manifestations of writing taken together, so to say, brackets human life. Man is encircled by writing. This ubiquity, ubiquity of the concept of writing to remind of Jan Asman's uh, discourse creates a strong social coherence of the nascent community that comes to replace the earlier amalgamating force exerted by tribal law and heaven cult. Now the Quranic wahi. Quran is at once the act of, uh, the act of reading and the corpus of text to be read, not from a materially present, but from a virtual 
transcendent writing, which would have been undecipherable to a non-profit. This unique act of supernatural natural reading thus resembles the decodation of an otherwise unintelligible um, writing, a wahi. And indeed, in the Quran, the receiving of wahi occasionally figures in the position of the prophet's act of reading. Um, Surah Al-Najm, my last quotation, um, has وَالنَّجْمِ إِذَا حَوَّ مَا ضَلَّ صَاحِبُكُمْ وَمَا غَوَّ وَمَا يَنْتِقُوا عَنِ الْحَوَّ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَى وَحْيٌ يُوحَى عَلَى مَا هُوَ شَدِيدُ الْقُوَّةِ By the star, when it plunges, your comrade is not astray, neither earth, nor speaks he out of caprice. This is not but an inspiration inspired, وَحْيٌ يُوحَى taught him by one terrible in power. The Egyptian scholar and exegete Nasser Hamid Abu Zaid explained the Quranic Wahi as a sign system employed by the divine speaker whose understanding is reserved to his elect. God's language is a coded non-verbal language, a Wahi, which needs to be translated into human verbal language. This new ranking of the non-verbal, commonly unintelligible science system turns the pagan wahi of loss, of aporia and loss, into a Quranic wahi of fulfillment. Wahi as the divine revelation, the noblest form of communication humans can aspire to, radically reverses the poetical use of wahi as the mirror image of the devastated past and as the emblem of the muteness of the material world. If this reconfiguration of the uh, poetic mute wahi of the pagan literature in the shape of the Quranic communicative wahi is no linguistic coincidence, but a purposeful conceptual stratagem, as already Josef Horowitz in 1926 had speculated, this would indicate that there is an intentional reversal of the pagan world view involved. The Quran is a text deeply anchored in its Arabian societal milieu. In the Quran, the thoroughly pessimist worldview of the pagan poet, his nostalgic question about the gone by times of human greatness and happiness, the Hellenistic question, ubi sun qui ante nos in mundo for ere, where have those gone that were there before us? It's rigorously reversed. It gives way to a positive attitude, confident in the sustained grace of divine human communication made possible through the prophetical power of decoding and reading wahi, the nonverbal language of the divine other. The conceptual lexicon of the Arabic language has been transformed. The rediscovery of writing as intelligible and meaningful, and moreover, its acceptance as a divinely established medium of authoritative communication in the Quran is a response to two heterogeneous challenges. The need to provi provide a solution for the aporia of the ancient poets, about his history and his past, and the given fact of the immense authority enjoyed by writing in the monotheist milieu of the Quranic community. The, Quran, the community's adoption of scriptural thinking, their conviction that God conveys his message in writing, indeed that he commissions writing, suggested a new structure of the world. The Uswal solely empirically perceived reality was turned into an eschatologically informed space, cyclical time giving way to the perception of a long durée filled with meaningful covenantal history. This is what the social philosopher Max Weber would have termed an enchantment of the world. Although this mutation to the of the pagan Arab world restages earlier similar processes of transformation, it is only in the Quranic case that it is triggered by a prophet's reading from a transcendent writing. 
and Lauch al Mahfuz, thus producing a rhetorical miracle, the Quran. The impact of the divine pedigree of writing, however, was to continue. How else should the followers of the Prophet within few generations have succeeded to create the celebrated scribal culture of Islam? Thank you. Thank you, Angelica, um, for this illuminating and uh, stimulating talk. I think in the f we've seen in the first uh, session um, how we have sort of two legs that have established, one about the physical nature of writing and one about the meaning of writing. And we're going to turn in the uh, second part of the morning session to how these, these two legs sort of created a body or supported a body of writing um, as, as, it, as it flourished in later centuries. Um, I think we should break now. Um, and we have quite a bit of time, which is wonderful. Um, so we will gather at 11.15 uh, for the second half of the morning session. There's coffee and refreshments outside. Anything else to? Oh, no, we don't. Do, we're not doing that right now. Okay, so we'll enjoy, and we'll see you at um, 11:15.